Today is December 28th, 2020, and my guest is author Scott Newstock of Rhodes College. He is the author of How to Think Like Shakespeare, Lessons from a Renaissance Education, which is our topic for today. I want to thank Plantronics for providing today's guest with the Blackwire 5220 headset, and I want to encourage listeners to go to econtalk.org and vote in our annual survey for your favorite episodes of last year. Scott, welcome to EconTalk. Thanks for having me, Russ. Let's start by talking about Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare is difficult. Uh, not every student can quickly access Shakespeare. Uh, a lot of them, I think, probably struggle to access Shakespeare even after a while. Why Why should people read Shakespeare today? It's, you know, lived so long ago. His language is so difficult. Mm -hmm. Why should we read Shakespeare? And Or, or why are his plays still performed? Well, a rhetorical one, question, actually. It is a Go rhetorical ahead. question. I can I sense that right from the beginning. That's perfect for a book that's very <laughs> preoccupied with rhetoric. Why does Shakespeare matter? Why does Shakespeare matter to me? You know, one one way I tend to think about it is that Shakespeare is a good occasion for thinking and and is a kind of avenue to all kinds of wonderful things about the way we create and the way we make and the way we read and the way we re relate to other human beings. And that's that's not unique to him as a single figure. We could, there's lots of other thinkers and writers and artists and philosophers we could point to that that have those same qualities, but they they really are condensed in that one figure in a in an exceptional way, and that's partly the the history of the reception of seeing Shakespeare and reading Shakespeare and responding to Shakespeare that that we're absorbing as well when we're engaging with him now in 2020. So, among the many things I love about Shakespeare are included the the history of responding to Shakespeare, which has gone on for 400 plus years. And you feel like you're kind of part of an ongoing community of those responses. So that's not that's not the case for many of his contemporaries who are who were great playwrights and were great peers and competitors of his. But but there's not the same legacy for let's say someone like Christopher Marlowe or Thomas Middleton in terms of being able to work back through that archive of responses to that figure. So that, you know, the, the plays themselves, the poems themselves are fascinating and and rich avenues for for thinking. But I but I also love the archive of of people who have responded in many different ways across the globe, across centuries, across all kinds of different reader positions. And you feel like you're in conversation with hundreds of other people who have who have engaged with this very poem or this this very play before so it's 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 part of a, an, an ongoing um, process of making that figure feel like a, a living presence for you today yeah I, I was thinking about my answer to that question you know why does Shakespeare matter today and I think I'm sure my listeners have heard me say before the the line from um, Faulkner's Nobel prize speech that that art is about the human heart in conflict with itself i there are a few people who have done a better job of plumbing that uh conflict than than shakespeare it's remarkable to me how uh, timeless he is in the sense that you know it's obvious that people have updated his plays put them in modern settings modern clothing etc they still work um but the thing that works that's really timeless is jealousy, love, ambition, anger, mm -hmm. violence. It, few people write about those emotions in 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 drama. I don't know his plays very uh, his poems very well. I'm, you know, I can quote a few lines from a few sonnets, but mm -hmm. his his plays explore that territory of the human heart in ways that you know I don't think anyone has done it quite that well. Um, what a what a bold statement! <laughs> but I'm going to go out on a limb. I think Shakespeare's really good. But I, you know, I think I, I think the reason it bears saying is that he's a lot of work, uh, language wise, and he's he's challenging, obviously, to read on the page, and he's challenging in in the theater. But it still works. It does work, and I think one of the ways that he is able to convey some of the, those intense emotions or those intense human conflicts is by staging his characters thinking about them in action that you you have many moments in the plays that i i love when i read them as well as when i see them staged where a character will say something like what you know basically what do i do now and that's a very captivating 
dynamic. I mean, we all feel that way constantly throughout our lives. And to see someone else kind of going through the thought process of, you know, where where am I and what's my next step and how do I proceed? And that's that's true for villains like Iago as much as it is for heroes and heroines who are lost and thrown on a, a shore of a new land where they don't know anyone and they have to figure out what happens next. So in some ways, I think, you know, those themes are timeless and, and lasting, but it's it's in part the way that they're conveyed through an individual's uncertainty about how to proceed that I think is is one thing that makes them very sympathetic for us, makes them feel accessible because we, we all have occupied those positions of uncertainty. And of course, it allows us to inhabit those characters with our imagination mm-hmm. and and to live vicariously is not the right phrase, really. It's to explore how we might behave in similar, maybe less dramatic, but similar challenging situations where we have to, we're at a crossroads. And we, I think, learn about life through those, not just through the mistakes we make or the good decisions we make, but also through the imagined decisions we make through fictional characters, narratives, and mm-hmm. uh, and literary figures. And I think that's a grossly undervalued aspect of, of literature as a, a source of value to, to readers. It's a, yeah, it's an amazing thing. And it's, it's very, it, it's hard to articulate it and it's hard, it, it is difficult to isolate what exactly that quality is, but we, we do feel it and it, and it's an amazing feel. I mean, we talk about characters in that way as if, as if they're human beings, whether yep. it's in a novel or in a film or in a, in a TV series or in a play or in a poem. And it's, it is a, an amazing craft and amazing art to be able to to create that impression that this is another human being that's thinking and that we can, as you said, inhabit or kind of occupy their position for a, a short amount of time and, and feel their feelings or, or imagine our way into their subject position. And that, you know, that's something that would have been trained by his education through some a, a basic kind of exercise where these little... 16th century schoolboys would have been asked to imagine what it would be like to be a, a, a widow at, in the Trojan War and how that would feel. And that's an, that's an odd thing to ask of a seven-year-old British boy, but it, it, does, it, it looks like it's weirdly good training for writing drama because that's a lot of what drama ends up being, which is imagining yourself acting in uncertain situations that aren't like your biographical situation. So I, I do think you're right about that quality of inhabiting, which is really um, one thing that feels inviting for us when we're when we're engaging with powerful representations of characters. Do you teach that way through that kind of imaginary drama where you ask students to inhabit a character and respond to maybe a situation that isn't in the in the book? I do try to, I mean, one in, in a couple of different ways, you know, with I try to get them thinking about the the making of the works and and looking almost at the mechanics of how this speech is constructed and why it works as well as it does, like tr- trying to think their way into the maker's head. Um, why would someone build this in this way? And I've done a good deal of work with um, a visiting director that we've been able to host at Rhodes College, Nick Hutchison, and he definitely helps our students think that way and think their way into character. But it's partly a process of, for him, it's a process of reading closely and thinking into, you know, what are the words on the page? And it's not imagining kind of um, method acting backstory. It's looking at what's actually there and then coming up with coherent and reasonable and meaningful ways to articulate why you would be saying what you're saying at that particular moment. Why would, or why would you be silent at this particular moment? What, what's going on in your head as you're overhearing your best friend fall in love with someone else and you feel like she might not really be as close to you anymore. So I think I, I, it's a way, it's a way of reading closely that helps animate your way into the, the mindset of those characters, which I think, I think is is what he was doing when he was staging those characters. And of course, we do that with human or fellow human beings. I think we're going to talk later about conversation. But you think about most of life, you know, we're we're watching a bunch of dialogue that we don't get the whole story. We don't get the inner. Mm-hmm. We don't get the inner monologue usually. By def, actually, by definition, we do not get the inner mm-hmm. monologue of mm-hmm. the people around us. And and we don't always get our own inner monologues. You know, we don't always hear them. They're there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's an interesting question of what role art and studying art of of say drama or you know movies and so on literature generally helps us be better interactors with the non-actors around us mm -hmm. or, you know our fellow human beings yeah i mean it it is it is in, in one way one way to think of those inner monologues or soliloquies is it's as if you're watching a stage conversation with yourself but it's in someone else's position and that you're you're kind of creating a, a dialogue with yourself by your own process of self questioning and i think that's that's at least that that's one of the ways in which those kinds of characters feel compelling is because you you feel like you're you're almost drawn into that dialogue because the the self questioning that's going on is a version of your self questioning or could be a version of your self questioning yeah. mm -hmm. do you have a favorite play by shakespeare i do have a favorite play have you read the winter's tale yes well, i've seen it a few times. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's magnificent. It's always captivated, underappreciated. I think. I think it. I think it is underappreciated, and I think, you know, there's there's many things I love about it. It, it, it for for me, it looks like someone who late in his career, is, kind of throwing everything on the table and <laughs> and uh, all the pyrotechnics that are available and and pushing pushing his medium to the limits of believability. So if you think Othello is uh, pushes your limits of believability, your your limits of uh, credulity in terms of watching a, a husband become jealous and murderous, uh, then compress that into three acts instead of five. Um, and then suddenly have a character drop off a baby and then be chased off stage by a bear and then have a, the baby on the shore picked up by shepherds and then have time come out and say 15 years have passed and now we're in the future and it's a sheep shearing festival and then have uh, characters that are in disguise that turn out to be fellow prince and princesses who have fallen in love and everyone's somehow magically reunited at the end but not everyone is reunited and so it's a it's a it's a really ambitious extraordinary play that you, I guess you feel like he's 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 giving every effort to see see the limits of theater. How how much can I do? And I think it's really hard to stage for that reason because I, I mean the main character Leontes is 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 an extremely um, a character who verges on incoherence at some points in his mad jealous rage. Though that feels like that is not so far off from how mad jealous rage leads us to incoherence and. And to have someone who it looks like he's basically his wife has died through his his false accusations of her infidelity. Careful here, spoiler alert. I don't don't yeah. give yeah I don't want to give too much of it away, much of it away, <laughs> but um, it it just it's just remarkable, and I find it as remarkable to read it as to as to see it. So I've I've seen it a couple of times just in the last few years, once here in Memphis and once at Shakespeare's Globe, and both incredibly different productions, but powerful and amazingly it. Amazingly different ways, and so it's it looks like kind of the the best of raw theater, and him trying to maybe reflect on his career and recycle all kinds of elements that you've seen before. I often I like teaching it as well because it's a great coda to the semester where students can say, "Oh, we saw that in yeah. this play, and that that this looks like this character that we heard before." And there's that father daughter relationship again, and there's the reuniting that we've seen before, and it has a it has an extraordinary final scene that yeah. is like nothing else in any of the plays. Yeah. So. No, so all true. I, I'm going to make a confession and then we'll move on. We'll leave for listeners not so interested in Shakespeare. We're going to move on to education generally in a, in a minute and talk about a lot of other interesting things, I hope. But I just want to say one thing about Shakespeare, which is I think my favorite play is um, right now would be Midsummer Night's Dream, which I'm surprised at. Uh, I, I was in it in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I played bottom in Pyramus. Uh, didn't think much of it at the time. Didn't think much of it for a long time. And then I saw one of the most extraordinary um, evenings of theater I've ever seen, which was a production of it at the uh, Shakespeare Theater Company here in in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. It was so magical, um, you know, included a scene where Puck used a hose to create a um, a mud wrestling match between two of the characters, and that's very Puckish. Like, what could be more Puckish? Another scene, he's up in the rafters with, I think he's eating popcorn because he knows something he's set in motion like that is going to go. Mm -hmm. It's going to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievably 
an amazing production. Yeah, I saw it. I actually got to see it twice. And I, the other part I, I feel, and this is the more serious art, art artistic question about Shakespeare, is his the tragedies, and I've only seen a handful of them, um, you know, Othello, Hamlet, Macbeth, those are the ones that come to mind. They're so dark. You know, it's about a character sort of spiraling downward forever. And it's never gets there's no there's no redemption. Um, whereas in the comedies, people learn things. You know, they learn that about their jealousy was misplaced. They learn that their love is actually, you know, gonna could persist. Um I just love Midsummer Night's Dream. I love comedy of errors. I love mm -hmm. Much Ado About Nothing. They are they just they make my heart sing in a way. Uh, obviously, the the tragedies aren't made, meant to make your heart sing, but but you know, Romeo and Juliet would be another one. They're just dark, dark, dark. Mm -hmm. well, you have anything cheerful to say about those things? You know, I'm thinking about Midsummer Night's Dream because next semester I'm teaching a seminar devoted to that play alone, and I'm I'm, I'm using it as exactly what I was saying earlier as an occasion for thought or as an avenue for thought because. We will be looking at his sources, so we'll be looking at Ovid's metamorphosis for the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, and we'll be looking at Chaucer's um, account of of Duke Theseus, and we'll be examining, you know, contemporary folklore, and then we'll be looking at the long history of the reception of the play and and the way that producing it has changed over the last four hundred years, and the way different films have interpreted it, and uh, musical opera Mendelssohn uh, productions related to the play. So yeah. it's a it's you know, but again, it's a it's a play that does have dark elements, and I mean, oftentimes what happens in a comedy, it looks like if it just took one different turn, it would be a tragedy. <laughs> it's and true. it's the same it's the same for Romeo and Juliet. You know, the first yeah. couple of acts look like they might as well be setting yourself up for a father figure, you know, pre preventing young lovers from getting together, but then eventually they they triumph, and it doesn't take that turn. But it but the the you know midsummer and romeo and juliet do cross over in in those ways with just one one turn could have moved things in the other other generic direction for sure mm -hmm. well let, let's switch gears here a little bit um so i want to say just a little something about your book it's um short and sweet it's lovely uh in print form it, it's a beautiful little book it's not so nice on the kindle which you've told me beforehand. So I want to encourage interested le listeners to get the real book uh, and, and the physical book. It's not so much about Shakespeare as it is for me, as it is about how to think about Shakespeare and education generally. And I want to I want to hear you talk a little bit about the purpose of education. When you start a class like the one you just mentioned, do you have a goal for your students other than they other than that they be informed? about Midsummer Night's Dream. Obviously, they're going to learn about Ovid and its influence. They're going to learn about different productions. There's, a, there's content. Mm -hmm. but there's another, usually, you could imagine different kinds of goals for education beyond just, oh, you're going to learn about something you didn't know about. Uh, and in particular, I was drawn by your quote from Addison, the 18th century essayist, what sculpture is to a block of marble, education is to a human soul. How does that, what does that mean? And how does it inform your own teaching? If it does, mm -hmm. well, I think you know. In some ways, that when I think about the ends of education, I have both very modest goals and very ambitious long-term goals that I would like to think emerge from those modest goals. So, the the very modest goals for any of my teaching is to encourage students to become more careful thinkers and to do that through thoughtful reading and writing and conversation. So that that's really modest, and that doesn't sound terribly inspiring. But I those those Not are so modest. Those are rare. <laughs> those are rare, <laughs> rare traits, and they're valuable. They're valuable uh, skills. Sounds to me always too to reduced a word, but they're they're valuable. They're they're virtuous things that are that are really hard to do. That they, I, I hear constantly from friends who who work in the corporate world of frustration about their smart young hires who don't read well and don't write as well as as they would like them to and i i th i think that helping students become more careful thinkers readers and writers is a is a a difficult thing to achieve but an incredibly worthwhile thing to achieve and i'd like to think it has a number of untold future benefits to their lives no matter what they end up doing and 
I, ideally that they will be better citizens ultimately and and better contributors to society because of that kind of work. But that's, again, that's the ambitious long-term goal. The short-term task is to, I think, be honest to the thing that we're reading and to not come to our reading with a lot of preconceptions and really try to look at what we're looking at closely and let it unfold before our eyes. And that's a hard thing to do as well. That's harder than it than it seems. I think it's, it's especially, especially with Shakespeare, I think it's easy to come to Shakespeare with a lot of preconceptions. And whenever I, I'm surprised sometimes when I slow down in class and we actually start to unpack a phrase and students often don't really know what the phrase is saying. They've kind of leapt to a, a presumption about what the, what the speech is, is doing. And, and the more we unpack it, the more kind of wonderful and fascinating it becomes. Well, that richness is a huge part of a close reading that's often you know, very hard to do. Uh, I think the Bible is very similar to Shakespeare in that sense that, that you're referring to, which is it, we don't realize how much Shakespeare and the Bible have infused our understanding of the world or our culture or literary motifs. So, you know, someone will say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that Shakespeare, that's already been done with those twins. Well, you know, he's kind of the guy who gave it to the world. And now it's in a, a thousand different movies and you've seen it mm -hmm. 50 times. Uh, you know, or the trick ending or the surprise ending. Well, there were people who came up with those early on and, and it's hard to come to them, as you say, with a fresh with a fresh mind. It's very hard. You know, one way that I think helps, and this is this is true for reading the Bible critically as well, is is thinking about these writings, these texts as responding to previous writings and sources and then being transformed by subsequent editors and subsequent readers. So thinking of, of these things as not static things in the past, but rather kind of living, uh, dynamic, ongoing, ongoing texts that demand continued interpretation and that, again, put you in conversation with countless other readers who have come come before you. So I think the more I can the more I can make that exciting and feel alive for students, the more I, I think that's cluing them into something that's powerful and meaningful and real about the way that we read. So uh, making making the, the work that we're reading feel not alien to them and make them feel like they're a peer to the work that we're reading is something yeah. that's that's a high priority for me. And that's, uh, you know, I'm thinking about when Agnes Callard was here talking about her book, Aspiration, she talked about, I think she said that and reading is about learning how to talk to dead people. Mm -hmm. um, that ongoing dialogue, the, the, you've, you have that extraordinary quote from, um, who is it? It talks about the salon, conversation in the salon. Um, Kenneth Burke is, yeah. is one of my heroes. He, he ends up saying that, that intellectual history, that, that's history is not even the right word. Just any, yeah. any conversation is something like you walk into a parlor and there was a conversation conversation that was going on before you arrived and you don't really know what's going on and you, it takes a little while to listen to the kind of get the gist of what the fight is about and then you realize that you start to have something to say and so you you make a statement and someone attacks you and someone else defends you and then you're kind of really caught up in it and eventually you depart and the conversation's still going on and it's really just a wonderful way to think about you know, you're not the first reader of anything and you're not the last reader of anything, but you do have something to say about it for that brief window when you're when you're engaging with it. So when you romanticize, as you did a minute ago, this this idea, and I love that romance, by the way, I'm totally mm -hmm. a sucker mm -hmm. for it. But this idea that that texts like Shakespeare are often responding to other texts mm -hmm. versus an academic, you have a natural impulse, say, oh, we got to go back and read Ovid now. Of course, mm -hmm. you don't have to read Ovid. You can read Midsummer Night's Dream without knowing any Ovid. I don't I've never read Ovid. I get a lot out of Midsummer Night's Dream, but the you know the academic in you says like, no, you got to see this is connected. You got to see this. You're part of this giant history, and there's something really beautiful about it. I think in thinking about the human enterprise, um, it's a wonderful quote from Tom Stoppard in Arcadia, which I'm not going to try to give, but it's uh, about that we're part of this long processional, that things are that, you know. We join it. It's a different metaphor, but it's the same metaphor, really. We join the mm -hmm. processional. Things are dropped and, and fall. people fall behind, but actually nothing's ever really lost. It's all, you know, part of this extraordinary human experience. And 
I love that. I find it inspiring. Does it, is it important or is it just poetic? No, I think it's important and because it's true. And I think it, it, it helps a reader feel like this thing is not, it, it, it's human and it's not alien to me. It is, I am, I am as capable as engaging with this as anyone else is. This is not an imposition on me. I am, I am a peer to Shakespeare or to any writer or any creator. And I, I can engage with it as, as an equal. And it's part of my inheritance as much as anything is. So I think what's, what's regrettable about so much about Shakespeare as a particular figure, but, but many, many figures like Shakespeare is that feeling like this is a monumental thing from the past right. that is, that is foreign and alien and uh, it's not me. And, and the more I think you can stage ways of, of finding your way into conversation with that past or whether it's uh, that phrase that Callard is using or the odd in line about breaking bread with the dead that Alan Jacobs has pulled on recently. It's, this, it's the same concept, which is that these are, this is part of an ongoing conversation or ongoing community and no one should be excluded from that conversation and, and nothing, is, nothing is so remote that it's inaccessible. I mean, things take a lot of infrastructure and a lot of introduction to make something distant in time and space feel accessible. But in, in principle, nothing should be totally inaccessible to, to anyone. And the more and the more the more education can stage that conversation, I think the better it tends to be. We use the word alien. The word that came to my mind was dead. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea that oh, that's in the past. You know, I'll just read the modern stuff. The idea that there is think there are things from the past that are not just they're not dead. They're first of all they're alive, mm -hmm. um, and they're alive because people have kept them alive. They've kept them alive through these ongoing conversations, either with the author or with others about the author, which is what education sometimes will be mm -hmm. with a guide, a teacher, an inspirer, uh, a coach. And I, I just, part of it to me is, is that it's our, it's our heritage as thinking creatures. It's not just, you know, the, it's often called, it's part of the Western canon, or it's really about coming to grips with who we are as human beings, which is really tricky. And here's some of the greatest minds, Shakespeare, BB1, who grappled with that. And here's your chance to, you know, understand what Shakespeare understood a little bit. Yeah. And I think, again, the my experience as a teacher is I, I learn something new every time I'm reading yeah. the plays or the poems with my students. And, and because they come at it with fresh eyes and they're a new interlocutor. And yeah. I love that. And that makes it so it's not dead for me. And I, the more I can make it alive for them in that way you were describing, the more it's, it's revivifying and invigorating for me as well. And that's what, that's what makes it worth, worth the while because it is a lot of effort. I mean, that's true. And that's true for anything that's not immediately contemporary to us. Uh, but it's, I, I think it's worth the effort. And I, I think it, again, it belongs to everyone. And I, I want to think about an education that, that doesn't cut off the past as dead or monumental or remote in, in some way, and, but sees it in conversation with the present. You have a quote from uh, Thoreau which I don't remember exactly, but maybe you remember it exactly. But it's basically, it's a version of something I've said, like it's my quote, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's something that is kind of uh, apparent when you start to think about it, which is you can't read all the books that have ever been written. So you should probably read the good ones, because the best ones, because if you don't, you might not ever get to them. Um, I, I said that, I told that to my youngest son last night when I was finishing your book, and he said, so uh, don't read Walden, right? I said, exactly. <laughs> that would be, it's, that's one of the valuable insights of that quote. You can just skip that one. Um, but but, I, but I, it comes to mind because I, your statement about you, you read them again, you get, more, you get a diff, something different out of them. Great works should, probably should be read more than once, some of them, even though it means there's another book you'll never get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we only have so much time. Um, I think what... Sometimes what I see end up, ends up happening is that there's the presumption. I think you were saying a version of this before, like, well, we already know that, or that's that's a given, or that's that's a static thing in the past, rather than no, it's it's still it's still <laughs> puzzling and it's still uh, malleable and it still shapes us and we still respond to it in different ways and we we respond to things in different ways across the paths of our lives. I mean, I think that 
you know, now that I'm a parent, The Winter's Tale feels a lot different to me than it did 20 years ago when I first read it. Or now that I've had, now I'm old enough to have had students who have passed away um, reading things that I had read with them, Shadows, you know, my reading of Milton's Elegy Lycidas feels a lot different now that uh, one of my students who love that is is no longer alive. So um, that that you're right. I mean, that the kind of math of you only have so much time in your life and there's only so much, you know, so many things you can read in that limited time um, that it's, it is kind of a luxury to go back to a few things repeatedly, but I, I, I feel really privileged to have that luxury in my life and to, and to help keep that alive for my students. Last thing I'm going to add, and this relates to education about, last thing I want to add about Shakespeare, although we may probably come back to him, but it's, um, you know, this idea that 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 their education is about acquiring facts. So if you read Othello, you, you get exposed to the idea that a jealous husband can be murderous. Um, oh, I knew that. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, let me just explain this to you. A jealous husband can be murderous. Yeah, okay. The idea that art can make lessons vivid. You have a quote, quote in the book. I'm not going to remember it or find it, but that, you know, that there's so many things that that we quote no, but we don't absorb. And art, I think, in Shakespeare, great artists help us absorb those lessons in a different way than just being told um, some fact. I'm, you know, right now I've been thinking my way into uh, Michel de Montaigne's essays, and he's got a, a number of great moments where he's talking about education, and he's frustrated with, I think, what you're describing the the kind of stuffing of facts into your head rather than feeling like you've absorbed something on a more profound, almost visceral level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Montaigne picks up a a famous metaphor for what he thinks education should be like, which is something like a bee flitting from flower to flower and picking up nectar and then bringing it back to the hive and transforming it into honey. And he, he says, you know, the opposite of that is when we ask our students to ingest excessive knowledge and then kind of vomit it up on the final exam. And that that doesn't feel like that knowledge has been digested or made internal in a in a more abstract or more more profound, almost corporeal way. You know, Montaigne's weird, fascinating and weird because he he obviously did learn many things and memorized many things and had a powerful education, but he but he he's he's very blunt about saying that that, that mode of of ingesting only in order to spit it up again is not really what we're we're talking about when we're talking about education. And that's why, you know, like the plot summary of most of Shakespeare's plays is pretty banal. <laughs> and and he's borrowing many of the plots from yeah. his peers and his predecessors and and things that he's read. So what's more fascinating is, you know, the way in which it's transformed, not the not the thing into which it was transformed, but the but the process of that creation, of that process of that making. And that's one thing that I emphasize throughout the book is trying to think of Shakespeare and, and all kinds of other figures as makers. And ideally, I think that should help inspire students to think of themselves as as makers again and, and people who are part of that human process of, of creation, not thinking that this thing is outside of me, but rather I want to ingest this and make it a part of me. And make something else out of it. And make something I mean, else, which right. Which could just be me, which would be mm-hmm. amazing. It's not, it's enough. To, it doesn't have to be you have to write your own book. It just, you make mm-hmm. yourself. I think that's an important, important part of the human human experience. You you mentioned the word visceral. I have to just mention that we don't usually think of what that word means, where it comes from. It comes from guts. <laughs> and I always think about getting a lesson, you know, into your gut, into your guts, into your bones. And visceral gets at that in, a, in such a great way. So I yeah, it's, corpor- to- it's really corporeal. You're incorporating something. You're bringing yeah. it into your body on a, on a profound level. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, you know, a fact that went into the hard drive, it's still there probably, but it's not mm-hmm. the same as front and center. And mm-hmm. I I want to talk about the quote you have of Iris Murdoch. The goal of education, she said, is to attend, to learn, to desire to learn. To attend meaning to pay attention, to to watch, to be attentive. But the next part I really love, to learn, to desire to learn. Now, usually I think people romanticize education or Idealize, idealize it by saying, oh, yeah, well, education is about teaching people how to learn. But that's not what she said. 
not to, it's not about teaching people how to learn. It's to teach them to desire to learn. It's an incredibly beautiful idea. It is. And it's really hard to achieve. I mean, yep. it's, if, if we if we knew how to do that, that, everything would be so much simpler. And that I think, I think that's one of the reasons it is so difficult to talk about education and and difficult to implement the things that we love about learning, because in in some ways it's more of a more of a of a craft or an art than it is a a raw science um, or something that's programmable or or could be reproduced. Um, with an algorithm, you know, part of that idea of learning to desire to learn is, I, I think, you know, when I think about on stages of my education, one thing that often comes to mind is that I was looking at teachers who were modeling that desire in all kinds of different ways and all kinds of different disciplines and with different pedagogies and different topics. There's There wasn't really any one thing that unified, you know, my high school math teacher and my high school Spanish teacher and my high school biology teacher, except for they were on fire with this thing that they loved and they wanted to they wanted to convey that excitement and share that. And part of what they were doing was modeling that continuing desire to learn and and helping inspire it through through the modeling. Uh, but it is it is tough and I don't I don't think any of us has the the secret answer for how how to achieve that, and it's you know it's as much part of parenting as it is part of teaching, where it it is something that's very elusive, and and you try all kinds of different ways of approaching it, and it's idiosyncratic to the individual, and something that might work for one student doesn't work for another for a whole host of reasons, and and part of the you know the luxury of being a teacher who has small classes is that you can afford to figure that out and get to know your students and in a way that you can't at a, at a much larger scale of, a, of, of education delivery. So, um, I mean, I think the Murdoch's right on and she's also pulling off of that great um, Simone Weil passage, which says different, a different version of the same thing, which is education is about cultivating a kind of attention. And, and Vey starts off with, again, a modest statement, something like, you're, you know, doing a math problem seems kind of banal at first, but if you can figure out ways to get enthralled by a math problem, that might down the line lead to kind of more grand ways of being enthralled by the world itself or, or creation itself. Um, so you, it, it is, it's a hard thing to model. And I, I don't, again, I don't think any of us know the one way to make it work. And that's great. We're all experimenting and we're all trying to make it work, but but we're all trying to find ways to draw attention to an object that's outside of ourselves, whether that's a physical object or a verbal object. Yeah, I was thinking about um, this quote I love of Plutarch, uh, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And it's an interesting thought that a great teacher shows you how they, shows you that their fire is burning. It's not necessarily, they don't, it's hard to kindle someone else's fire, mm -hmm, but at least mm -hmm. seeing someone else's fire burning. And of course, fire is a beautiful thing because I can share my fire with you and I have, it's a public good in econ jargon terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't get any less because I've, I've helped your fire get lit. Uh, really a beautiful, um, you know, an incredibly beautiful metaphor. But the math point is extremely interesting because, uh, you know, my wife's a math teacher, listeners know, and Sometimes students say, why do we have to learn all this? I'm never going to be a mathematician or I'm never going to go into engineering. And of course, some of them turn out they do, they are. They didn't realize it. They get they get that fire kindled mm -hmm. and they decide, hey, I'm good at this, actually. I thought I wasn't, but that's a beautiful thing. But the other part is just that that insight that um the aesthetics of a proof of a poem and so on, which I'd never thought about that you just mentioned, that one of my favorite moments in in um in life, actually, is the time my statistics professor at University of North Carolina, and I'm struggling with his name, it might come to me in a minute, uh, but he taught us three different proofs of, I think, the central limit theorem. One used characteristic functions, and it was, quote, a waste of time. There was no, none of us, it was a graduate class. I was taking it as an undergraduate. And it, I don't know, if it, was, it was a waste of time probably for most of the graduates, but for, as an undergraduate, in theory, it was a waste of time. It was one of the most inspiring things I ever saw, not because he did such a great job proving it, because I suddenly saw that that this insight was 
could be done, could be illuminated in these from these different directions. It it, it blew my mind. Um, it really was just it was just a moment of pure poetry in a math class, in a statistics class. And um, apologize to that teacher for not remembering his name. Maybe I'll find it. But um, what a beautiful thing that is. And it is beautiful. Anyway. It is. It is. It is beautiful. I mean, I have. I have a similar anecdote from, and I. I do remember my teacher's name. This was uh, Arnold Edelberg at, <laughs> at, uh, at Grinnell College, and he, there would be times where he would stop in the midst of a proof, and he would say, "You know, look at that. We, we could have done this in kind of thirteen clunky, ugly steps, and kind of ham-fisted our way to the." to the answer, but we did it in seven steps and it's it's more elegant than these other ways that we could have could have done it. And I always bring that up with my when I'm when I'm when I have science majors in class, because I think sometimes there's the impression that, you know, it's a humanities subject and this is all subjective and the sciences are all objective. And in fact, the sciences are suffused with wonderfully subjective in the best sense. Like the subject is an expert who is knowledgeable about this thing and knows and knows a lot and is able to make evaluative judgments that are based on their accrued authority. And and I so I bring up that anecdote because I think it's it's a great example of you talking about the aesthetic quality of of thinking different routes to the same answer. Uh, there's a there's a great book that just came out called 99 Proofs, which does take just walk through 99 different variations on the same problem. And that's in the introduction, the author mentions that that comes was inspired in part by a 1950s French writer who wrote 140 some variations on a little anecdote about getting on the bus and getting jostled and then getting off the bus. But it's it's written in kind of bureaucraties and it's written as a kind of haiku and then it's presented in florid language and then really blunt, hard nosed crime novel language and. After a while, the joke starts. It's it's a joke. It's a stunt at first, but it does make you realize, wow, there are many ways you could say the same thing, and that again, that's part of our human capacity for it, amazing inventiveness. And then finding, you know, what's the best way for this occasion? What's what's the best way for me to frame this, given the audience that I have, and given the resources that I have, and given the time that I have? That's that's part of learning to become a more fluent human being, I think, in general, whether that's as an economist or as a scientist or as a politician or as a speaker or a parent, you know, what's, what are the right resources that I should apply at this particular moment, given the task that's in front of me? That's, that's rhetorical at heart. And that's something that definitely was infused in, in the education that someone like Shakespeare would have received in the, in the 1500s. There's a great example that I bring up in the book by the humanist educator um, Erasmus from his wonderful book, uh, of copia or of copiousness. And, and copia is a word that it gives us the word copy, like a, a photocopied piece of paper, but it also gives us that word copious, like cornucopia, like profusion of excess. And Erasmus takes this one sentence, uh, your, your letter has pleased me greatly. So it's about as banal, you know, it's like an email response you would say right now, like, thanks for your email. But then he goes through this pyrotechnic list of variations on how many different ways you could rephrase that, you know, invert the subject and the verb, uh, think about different synonyms that you could deploy for uh, the adverb, think about ways in which you could make it more elaborate or make it more blunt. And it's, it's kind of a joke. It, it makes you chuckle a little bit, but then you realize, actually, there are a lot of different ways you could say that line. And there's probably one that's best suited for right now for this, for this occasion. So it's it's a stunt, but he's he's doing it as a stunt in order to prove a point about you know that it's even something that seems like the most simple thing you could say has a lot of different ways you could go about saying it. Yeah, I'm gonna take a real stretch here, okay? I'm gonna take take a real leap. Sure, sure. So I, for when I was thinking about you know aesthetics and in, in math, uh, I thought about the fact that e to the i pi equals minus one. Now, that is, I think I got that right. I think I've probably quoted it before on the program. So you think about that equation. First of all, minus one is a really radical idea. It's a crazy idea. There's negative numbers. How do you count negative one? Well, you mm -hmm. can take one away, I guess. It's like minus, subtract one. Okay, I get it, kind of. E is a really magical number that Euler, the mathematician created pi, we know is this wondrous relationship between the radius of a circle and its circumference. Um, I 
I is is an absurd human creation. Uh, it's the square root of negative one, correct? I'm, I'm totally blanking on I now, but I think it's the square root of negative one. Uh, if I get that wrong, we'll have to cut this section, whole section out. <laughs> uh, you know, what times what equals negative one? Well, nothing. Well, we'll call it something. We'll call it I. So you have these four incredible human creations, mm -hmm. and they all evolved at different times in history. And yet, at some point, I don't know who it is. Somebody realized that e to the i pi equals negative one. I don't want to stretch this too far, but it's a little bit about appreciating that Shakespeare came from Ovid and is going to impact and can maybe describe current events right now, which we won't go into. But uh, there's some Shakespearean stuff going on in America now and then. Um, being able to step back and see that um, those connections. And at one point, I think you say in your book, and I think of this all the time, that, that learning is about being able to make connections, to see patterns. Of course, sometimes mm -hmm. they're not there. But to connect things that that are seemingly disparate, so e to the i pi equals negative one is one of those. But to feel, and you can you could learn to understand that without any understanding of who Euler was, the history of a circle, and trying to understand what the, how do you measure circumference, mm -hmm. the whole invention of imaginary numbers and the number I, the the concept of i, the imaginary number. But when you see it in its fullness, it probably makes you a better mathematician for starters. But it's more than that; it makes you a better human being. You 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 you. You see yourself as part of this enterprise of thinking that you're going to miss. Don't miss it. It's important. It's well, it's extraordinary. I agree, and I think it again. It's a, the way you just described it, it. It helps. It helps humanize something that might seem abstract and dead and external to us, but rather, it you know, a number of different people in a number of different cultures across centuries struggled with these abstract concepts and the more you can kind of identify with that struggle i think the less the less distant it feels from you the more immediate it ends up feeling like this is human beings did this and you are part of that you're part of that body of of human beings and you you're struggling with this in a different way at a different moment but it, it's exciting to see someone else struggling i think i do think that the more you can kind of historicize and humanize math in any discipline and and see it as a stage of people struggling with something. The more the more engaging it ends up being, and that's the same for looking at at writers struggling with a, a draft of a poem or or a draft of a of a play, and and watching something emerge from their writing rather than seeing just the final product and thinking the poem was always this way or the play was always this way or the statue was always this way or the formula was always this way. And they say Beethoven was a genius because every note he wrote always felt like it was inevitable. But of course, and it may have been for him. I mean, that that's a certain kind of genius. But you give the example of Elizabeth Bishop's poem, <clears throat> One Art, which is one of my favorite poems, that she had 17 different drafts. When you see the final draft, it's like, boy, it's, it's so perfectly crafted. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't exactly crafted. It it emerged, and use the language of emergent order in, in your book about it, that, it, that it's, a, it's akin to flocks of geese or schools of fish that emerge out of, out of individual... Uh, activity and create a whole that isn't any part's intention. And that each of those drafts was ended up being a contributor to that final version in a way that she didn't intend. She didn't sit down and say, oh, let's make a perfect poem. That extraordinary. Right. Yeah, she didn't, you know, that that particular form, as you know, is is called the villanelle. It's a very tightly controlled form that has tight rhyming within it. And it, it's kind of a series of variations on the phrase, the art of losing isn't hard to master. And, but she didn't start it as a villanelle. And I think that that really captures something amazing. Cause the, you know, we do, the poets often do sit down and say, I want to do a villanelle and I want to do it this way. And that's fine. But it's, it is intriguing to, that one of the most famous villanelles of the 20th century, probably the most famous English language villanelle of the 20th century did not start as a villanelle, it's, it, she kind of felt her way into that form. And it's clear at some point she, there, there was an intuition that this form, which is about repetition and control, is weirdly well-suited to the kind of repetition and control we might feel when we're thinking about loss and trying to master the so-called art of losing and, and thinking about losing a lover or thinking about losing a, a friend or a child or a city. And the 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 form oddly has a kind of it's well suited to the topic, but it didn't start out that way. And she and you you look at those drafts and you can see 
it's almost like the analogy I bring up is it's almost like watching a uh, like planets forming out of a kind of amorphous gas and suddenly the form makes sense and it and it and it aligns and it clicks and then you look at the final thing and it's that much more rich for having looked at the drafting process having having watched the mind at work that then was able to refine and polish this amazing powerful poem that you that you can't let go once once you've seen it and we have you know we don't we have small versions of that across Shakespeare's publications where you look at a, a, a quarto version of the play, kind of paperback version of the play, and then a later revised version in the in the big hardcover folio version of the play. And the closer we come to the present, the more we have those kinds of drafts where we can look at the process that somebody went through in in creating a poem or a movie or or any any creation. And I, I just think it's exciting. I think it's again, it makes it feel like it's it's accessible in a way that looking at the final product alone feels more more alienating. Well, it gives you permission. It does give you permission. You can't write that poem the first time. You, mm-hmm. of course, you and I probably won't write it after seventeen. But <laughs> but the idea that the first draft doesn't have to be is it never ever going to be for most of us unless you're Flaubert the the uh, the final draft and that you don't have to then abandon. A mediocre draft that there's let it let it grow let it emerge yeah let it simmer let it let yeah. it linger um no absolutely and that's i talk about that all the time with my students in in the drafting process to to see it more as a process rather than i just need to write this thing to get up to the word count but rather you know what am i trying to say what's the best way to say it and at first it's probably not going to be a great first draft but it's 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 because you have something on paper that then you can shape it again and and find the best way to say that you want to say what you want to say. So let's talk for a minute about conversation, which is one of the chapters in your book. Um, we're having what I think of as a very good conversation right now. I'm thinking of things I hadn't thought of before. Uh, ideally, you are too. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who are listening are thinking of things they haven't thought of before. And it's not just, oh, wow, Shakespeare went to school. I never thought about that. Yes, he did. Or Shakespeare was influenced by Ovid. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. But there's something I hope deeper going on is as you listen and and Part of my goal in this program is to help listeners absorb lessons through the back and forth of our conversation, Scott, which is you know an incredible gift that I've been privileged to have. But I find it striking, and what are your thoughts on this, that as parents and teachers, we don't really teach our children how to have a conversation. We teach them manners. You know, we teach them not to interrupt. I'm not, I didn't really learn that very well. Uh, interrupt all the time. Less Zoom is an econ kind of really helped me interrupt less because it it you get a lot of crosstalk and it's confusing. But interjection, better than interruption, is is a I think is a part of a of conversation often. And yet, so we have some manners, you know, be a good listener, don't interrupt. But we don't teach our children or students how to craft a conversation with an, another interesting person. We model it to some extent. Um, I don't think I've never heard of a class on how to be a, a conversationalist, how to how to talk. Um, what do you think of that? I guess we, you know, maybe it's part of the long term decline of rhetoric and verbal arts that are less emphasized in the twentieth twenty first century than they had been in earlier centuries. But, you know, part of Again, part of what we do enjoy out of fiction as well as drama is watching people, complex, smart people speak to each other at intensified moments. So, you know, when you're reading a Jane Austen novel and you're overhearing, as it were, two intelligent, uh, emotional, insightful people trying to work their way into a conversation with each other and you and you see both the blocks that happen the blockages that are put up by both sides as well as the the break ultimately the breaking through of those blockages by the end of a of an austin novel i think it's something similar that you can witness in in a good back and forth or give and take of a drama and you see it even even on the level of the line that shakespeare will occasionally craft a, a half you know the standard line is 10 syllables long sometimes he'll make a line that's eight syllables, and then I stop, and then you pick up two syllables, and you're in effect completing my my line. You're completing the, la- the math of my line. 
And that kind of give and take or turn taking is something that is modeled in those plays. And it does, again, come out of, it comes out of the pedagogy of that period, which is conversation driven. Um, but I think you're right that we don't, other than modeling it, we don't stage it as much as maybe previous centuries had in, in their pedagogies. We don't critique it. You know, one mm-hmm. of the, I think the hardest part of, of being a human being is one of the hardest parts is, is knowing what to say and what not to say. That's really in many ways the art of conversation. Uh, as a host, I had so many other thoughts in this conversation that I kept to myself, um, which pained me. I'm, I've gotten better at it. In the old days, I just blurt them out anyway, just, <laughs> you know, take up more of the airtime. They're extraneous, some of them, but they come to mind. So I want to share them. And I think it's interesting that we don't teach people, not literally teach, but we don't critique conversation of, say, among in art or in daily life. We do in daily life. We'll say to somebody, boy, I wish you hadn't said that about so-and-so to so-and-so's face. I think you really hurt her feelings. We'll say those things. but And that's, I think, where you learn or you see the, the reaction and you go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Mm-hmm. But I think it's interesting that we don't do it in any semi, by formal is the wrong word, but we don't, it's so little instruction around it. And we do get, I'm trying to think of parallel places where it, it does take place. But it, it it does happen in language instruction. You know, many, many uh, handbooks for language instruction begin with that premise of uh, these are, these are kind of the codes or the moves that you make in order to say, Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. What's your name? My name is so and so, and that that kind of turn taking that you end up modeling there. Hmm. Uh, that no. that's the one place that I think would be most directly applicable in terms of the discipline that that offers that kind of modeling in, in contemporary teaching that I can think of. But it, you know, as a teacher, that there teach there are students who talk too much, and there are students who don't talk enough. And part of your job is to do what you can to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm set the the right balance in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other students appreciate it. They appreciate it when you bring out a great comment from a quiet student or you keep a active mm-hmm. student a from over-dominating. Student. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I don't know. I, I, I don't have anything more to say about it, but. Well, again, it's an art. I mean, it's not a, it's yeah. not a science and it's something craft. that we're all, it's a craft that we're all practicing all the time. And, and when you see someone do it well, it's really a marvel and you, and sometimes it's kind of invisible as it's happening. And afterwards you realize, wow, she really conducted that conversation incredibly well and drew the whole class together in a in a complex unified dynamic that would be hard to break down into its component parts, but had a, a kind of vivacity to it as it was as it was unfolding. And and a certain kind of great seminar teacher is really extraordinary in that way. It's a huge part of leadership in in business and elsewhere, also. Mm-hmm. I mean, how a manager, CEO, a leader, what they say, what they don't say is a huge part of the job. And I think it's, um, again, interesting that business schools don't teach that ever. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't teach you how to write and they don't teach you how to speak. Two of the probably most important thing. They don't teach you so much how to think either. But other other than that, they teach you a lot of of stuff. But those three things, thinking, writing, and speaking are under – I think under um, students are underexposed to them in, in the modern world too much. Or, or we turn them into really abstract things that don't work on the on the practical level. I mean, I think when I when I one of the frustrations that animated the book in the first place was the ways in which my eldest daughter was being taught reading and writing comprehension in in grade school, and it it, it just even even I couldn't piece out the assignments sometimes, and I remember my wife and I kind of looking over them and puzzling over what was what was being asked of her. And it, it was as if reading had been turned into such an odd, conceptually driven process that wasn't animated by people wanting to articulate things to each other in in compelling ways. So you know, part of part of just trying to puzzle over that about what what was missing there or what was lacking there was thinking of about kind of wrong turns that I think education sometimes takes rather than conceiving of ex- education more as a kind of ongoing craft or an ongoing uh, uh, art that's that's in an ongoing conversation. Uh, let's close with you talking about 
uh, your experience uh, teaching in prison. Tell us about that program you were in, what, what its goals were, and what that experience was like. Yeah, it's a, you know, there's a number of programs like this have been developed around the country over the last couple of decades. This is one that my colleague Steve Haynes in religious studies has developed at a, at a women's um, facility in Western Tennessee. And it's modeled in part on a humanities sequence that is taught at the college. So it's, it's a series of readings based in part on the availability of faculty that he's able to recruit to teach in the program. Uh, it didn't used to be offered for credit, though it's just begun to be offered for credit recently. But the, the model is basically a common set of readings that we do as a group and a visiting faculty member who helps conduct a conversation in, in that space uh, once a week across the course of a semester. In my case, you know, my, Steve had asked me if I wanted to teach a play and I didn't feel like I had the luxury, I only had two sessions and I wanted, I would have wanted more sessions if I was going to focus on one play. So I suggested that we look at the sonnets, which are compact and you can really do a lot of wonderful stuff with just a handful of poems in an hour and a half. And I th I think that worked really well for a number of reasons. I mean, the sonnets are just great and they're they're conducive to that kind of reading and thinking and conversation. They also, as it happens to be, thematize the notion of constraint and even talking about the sonnet as a kind of a prison is something that sonneteers have done for centuries. So there was a an odd, you know, powerful echo about thinking about the the troubling and disturbing aspects of constraint as well as the liberating aspects of of constraint and choosing to be within a certain space and devoting yourself to a certain kind of conversation for a certain span of time. So you know, one of the one of the things that I come back to again um, repeatedly in the book is thinking through ways in which uh, agreeing to work within constraint actually can be powerfully inspiring and liberating. So, say, you know, your podcast has you've you've chosen the length of your podcast. It, it could have been shorter, it could have been longer, but once you've determined that length, that's become your your constraint, and different conversations can unfold within that particular constraint that can't unfold in a five minute podcast or a five hour podcast in the same way that uh, certain kinds of conversations can unfold in a five, 50 minute class that can't in a 20 minute class and can't in a three hour seminar. And part of the ingenuity, I think of any, any human activity is figuring out what the constraints are and then what are the best ways of working within, when, within those particular constraints. So that could be something as simple as a 14 line poem, like a sonnet or, a classroom or a, a two and a half hour drama, whatever the case is, recognizing those constraints and then finding out the best ways to kind of flourish within within those constrained spaces. What do you think they get out of it, your students in that setting? I, you know, we talked earlier about the challenge of Shakespeare. The sonnets are they're not easy. They're not they're not mm -hmm. um, straightforward. Was there a challenge of entrance into the text to start with when it was overcome? Did they all get have access to it essentially? And and when when they did, did they what what was the impact, do you think? I mean, obviously a lot of times we have no idea what the impact is. Yeah, teachers. we we often never do in the short term. I mean, in the in the immediate context of the class, you know, some of them showed up on the first day having already translated the sonnets into their own poetic versions and that was inspiring. I mean, I I can't. I don't think that that's happened with my students um, who I'm regularly teaching. So, I mean, I think there was, you know, it's it's cliche, but it, I think it's true that they have a real hunger for those kinds of conversations that they don't always have access to in a structured format within the institution. So that they were they were yearning for it and they were eager to be there. And in a again a kind of cliche way, because there were no grades and there were no assignments, it was just it was the real thing, you know, it was, let's look at this and try to f piece it out and figure it out. So, you know, I love that they came in with their own translations unprompted because that to me is one of the best ways to engage with any work of art is to figure out how it works and what makes it tick and, and reframe it in your own recreation that you're kind of thinking your way in. Again, going back to what we were saying earlier about inhabiting 
another subject position. You know, why would why would Shakespeare say this in this way? And how how would I say? How would I try to articulate that same thing in a different moment, in a different um, uh, in a in a different scenario, in a way that is meaningful to me? Um, you know, what did they take away from it? Other than that, I I, I like the density of the sonnets because. You, you really can master a 14 line poem in 30 minutes and feel like you have it in a way that I think it's harder to apprehend an entire play in, in a short span of time without seeing it performed and having the kind of immersive, immersive experience of being in the theater co-present to other actors. So again, I, I, I'd like to think that one of the things that we were able to work on was just that intensity of being able to read closely a small, a small densely constructed textual object um, but again, that's, that sounds like a modest goal, but I, I'd like to think that that has bigger reper, repercussions down down the line. But do you think did it did it change them in any way? I, I don't know about that. I would I, I I wouldn't be able to hazard hazard an answer to that. I didn't. I mean, they did it change them in the sense? I don't know. I, I, I would have a hard time answering that. They, they were appreciative in a way that, again, my students aren't typically like thanking me as they all thank the professors as they as they depart and shake your hand. And it feels like there's a real gratitude that's not always the case in, in a conventional classroom. I'm thinking about it because uh, so much of so-called rehabilitation is focused on vocational training. Mm-hmm as opposed to value acquisition. I mean, there's a religious component to rehabilitation in certain, historically, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And, and that happens in certain, you know, without intention. Um, but I, I, I find, I like to think that we all need art in some dimension and that providing that was value in and of its own sake, for its own sake. I don't know. I mean, anecdotally, what my, so I, you know, we my colleague is the only one who sees the entire course over the whole semester because he's hosting it and he's there for every session, but the the other faculty are coming in only for two or three sessions. So it's harder to get a sense of the whole for me, having just kind of dipped in for those two weeks. But he does relate that, you know, a fairly consistent response is a sense of, um, I mean, something more, again, basic, but profound, like students feeling like they been heard and someone was interested in what they had to say and that they had it was a there was a liberating effect to feeling like they were involved in a conversation about serious things with professors who were who were spending time with them so I, again that that might seem like a small thing but in some ways that's an enormous thing I agree. Mm-hmm. yeah somebody was attending my guest today has been scott Newstock, his book is How to Think Like Shakespeare. Scott, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. I enjoyed it, Russ. Me too. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.